Welcome everyone. I'm Bruce Landsberg, a member of the National Transportation Safety Board, and would like to welcome you to a special webinar that affects all drivers, truckers, bus drivers, and regular motorists uh, concerned with distracted driving or people are using their personal electronic devices, cell phones, while driving. The National Distracted Driving Coalition, which is a group comprised of many different organizations, is focused on making our roads safer from the distracted driving epidemic. In September, NDDC released a fact sheet sharing the roads with commercial vehicles, and it outlines why this is important and then provides sources for additional information. Today, I'm joined with Robin Robertson, co-chair of NDDC, who will introduce our presenter shortly. A quick overview of today's program. Anywhere you drive in the US, you share the road with large trucks. And crashes with large trucks, as obvious as it seems, are more lethal because of their size and their mass. And distracted free driving is an important part of sharing the road. From the employer perspective, they have an incentive to prevent crashes and also to provide resources to help with the educational effort. And the first part of the discussion is to explain why that's important. And then the second part is to discuss some of the resources that are available to all drivers about sharing the road. A few of important statistics here. First off, car drivers, light vehicles, cause about 75% of the crashes between themselves and large vehicles three quarters of the crash is caused by individual drivers. Many professional drivers learn about this problem as a condition of employment, but it's time to reach everyone, the fleet drivers, those making sales calls, delivering pizza and ride sharing, and ordinary commuters as well. The costs of crashes are substantial. A recent report from the National Employers for Traffic Safety showed that the costs have risen dramatically over the last several years. Direct employer crash costs from motor vehicles are over 72 billion, with a B, dollars just in 2019 alone. This includes medical care, liability, property damage, and productivity where they lose a driver either temporarily or sadly, permanently. Distracted driving costs alone are almost $19 billion. That's more than speeding and alcohol combined. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2020, 22% of all worker deaths were motor vehicle occupants on the public roads. So what can employers do? Well, first off, we need to think of road safety as an essential part of workplace safety and have policies to raise the awareness about sharing the road with large vehicles and preventing distractions. But it's also about the training and education uh, to learn how to avoid distractions and sharing the road. Many trucking companies are invested in driver training, coaching and monitoring tools, and they've implemented distracted driving policies in the workplace. But if we're really going to reduce distracted driving, we have to get the employees in other industries to follow suit. Here at the NTSB, we have a very robust policy about not using your cell phone for other than driving tasks while a vehicle is underway. And there are penalties associated with people who do that. Now, many of the businesses rely on fleets and reimburse employees for mileage in their own vehicle. They don't actually own the vehicles. Either way, many employees, the road is their workplace. And even for those who do not have a commercial driving activity, they will have a lot of commuters who are driving to and from work. So educating all of these drivers is essential. We do not multitask well. Let's talk about some of the resources, and then Robin and our presenters will go through them in more detail. First, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, FMCSA, offers materials and videos that can be integrated into driver education and employee training programs. The American Trucking Association, which represents over 30,000 fleets, 
and stakeholders in the trucking industry has a share the road program and they have an online website with driving tips and that can be incorporated into an education and training. Point is, you don't have to create your own programs. All of this information already exists and it's available free of charge. Virginia Tech Transportation Institute has a share the road program. They've reached over 20,000 students to date and they target teen drivers who are especially vulnerable. The state trucking associations, the ATA Federation has members in every state, which are the voice of the trucking industry in state capitals. And finally, Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance, CVSA, in collaboration with uh, trucking safety officials and industry representatives have their own training materials available for you to use. Final thought, we're coming up on one of the busiest times of the year for highway travel. There'll be lots of people traveling to see family and many commercial vehicles out there delivering packages. And in some cases, we may have some really bad weather. Please devote 100% of your attention to the driving task. We want everyone to enjoy the holidays and to be with us next year. Now, let me turn the program over to Robin, who will be your MC and to introduce our panelists. Robin. Great, thank you very much, Vice Chairman. Um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to chair the National Distracted Driving Coalition on behalf of the NTSB. The diversity of organizations that contribute to the work of the coalition is really testament to the importance of distracted driving as a road safety issue, and also the commitment of many sectors to make roads safer by creating a culture of attentive drivers. For those of you not familiar with the National Distracted Driving Coalition, you can learn more about it by visiting usndc.org. Uh, and I have just a few slides that I will share you uh, share with you. Uh, if you've not yet seen the website, I would encourage you to, to check it out. Um, lots of good resources there, including some of the information that we're going to be talking about today. So here is the website. You can see up at the top, um, there's a contact us as well as several social media channels. There are also, uh, there's also a downloads page, which is probably the best, uh, the best section of the site to, uh, to visit in addition to our, our media. The National Distracted Driving Coalition has a, a 21 point national action plan. We are a good chunk of the way through completing those action items. And you can see at the top, uh, they're grouped according to data education, employers, enforcement, legislation, and technology. So a lot of work being addressed by the coalition and some of the individual pages. Uh, you can see the, the downloads that are available. And today, the download that we're talking about with the sharing the roads piece uh, is in the employer section. And I also just wanted to give a quick shout out to our steering committee members, the organizations uh, that are part and parcel of this, who help uh, row the boat every day, uh, as well as our many stakeholders who've really been an integral part of contributing to the, um, the outputs coming from the coalition. So a quick thank you to all of them. Um, okay, uh, what else do we wanna talk about? Um, Today's webinar will be added uh, to the website uh, where the download's located. Um, I'd also like to take a moment and just thank the vice chairman on behalf of all of the members and stakeholders. Um, he has really provided strong leadership and consistent support uh, for this initiative during his tenure at NTSB as vice chairman. And the work coming out of the coalition really would not have been possible without his guidance and expertise. And while he, is, he has completed his term as vice chairman, uh, his work in the safety field will continue as a member. And we uh, certainly are looking forward to his continued uh, engagement with the coalition and our activities. Um, I think uh, the vice chairman provided a lot of important information to really set the stage for today's webinar. The scope is really tackling the issue of large trucks and then passengers or light vehicle drivers uh, on the road, just to highlight some of the important distinctions between the types of vehicles and how they require different skill sets and different tools 
uh, to operate them. And those differences really underscore the importance of drivers of both types of vehicles learning how to share the road safety, safely. Um, I know we're going to hear a little bit of data today about uh, crashes, and I believe Matt's going to speak to some of that coming from naturalistic driving studies. Um, with the new driver monitoring technologies, we get, we get better information with respect to crashes. Um, we have four experts who are going to speak to important facets of the problem, and I would encourage attendees to put your questions in the chat. As we go along, we are going to um, go through the presentations first, and when the presentations portion is completed, we are going to move on to the questions. Uh, so I'm going to do all the introductions and then turn it over to the speakers who will who will hand it off to uh, to the next speaker. Um, Dan Mayhew first, uh, very proud to have Dan in my office. He's a senior research uh, scientist and advisor with the Traffic Injury Research Foundation who has managed numerous uh, research projects um, during his 40 year uh, tenure with us. His expertise spans the fields of young and novice drivers, graduated driver licensing, uh, driver education and improvement programs, and driver training. He's also recognized uh, internationally as an expert in the field of road safety, having testified before uh, legislatures and, and inquests uh, and um, a whole a whole kind of spectrum of uh, policy uh, forums and his research interests in addition to young drivers, uh, which we'll be talking about today, include motorcycles, uh, aging drivers, data systems, driver competencies, and commercial vehicle driver licensing. Um, our second speaker is Jack Kostelnik. Uh, Nick, he has nearly 40 years of experience in traffic safety, mainly focused on commercial vehicle safety. He is currently a transportation specialist with the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration in the Office of the Administrator. He's been with the agency for 19 years and has worked in the area of grants management, policy development, and the development and implementation of commercial motor vehicle safety programs, which he'll be speaking to today. Prior to coming to the FMCSA, Jack was an Arizona State Trooper who retired in 2004 after 20 years of service to the citizens of Arizona. Uh, our next speaker is Kevin Grove in the American Trucking Association, who is the American Trucking Association's Director of Safety and Technology Policy, and he is an expert in the field of commercial vehicle safety, specializing in technology and driver safety. Kevin was the uh, lead, along with Jack on the subcommittee uh, who put together the Sharing the Roads fact sheet. Uh, Kevin works with fleets, manufacturers, and suppliers, helping the trucking industry deploy new and innovative safety programs. And Matt Camden, our final speaker, is a senior research associate in the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute's Division of Freight, Transit, and Heavy Vehicle Safety. He is an expert in occupational driving safety with over 15 years of experience developing and evaluating solutions to making our roadways safer. And Matt specializes in light and heavy vehicle safety and leads VTTI Sharing the Road with Trucks program, which the vice chairman mentioned. So first we're gonna hear from Dan then from uh, Kevin Grove, then from Jack, and then from Matt. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dan to get started. Thank you very much, Robin. I appreciated those uh, um, uh, excellent in introductions, uh, providing some background on my history. Uh, what I'm going to focus on today is uh, teen uh, drivers and sharing uh, the road with commercial uh, vehicles. Uh, what I'd like to start out with, however, is providing you with a bit of a, a description of what uh, turf traffic engine research is all about. First and foremost, we're a charity, a uh, rich charity, and we provide services in several areas. Certainly our bread and butter uh, would be research on road crashes. It, it's a lot of what we do, but we're also very much in, intimately involved in program and policy development. We do a lot of evaluation in terms of planning, programming, and policy evaluations. And because we produce so much information uh, over the course of the work that we do and the research that we conduct, there's lots of knowledge transfer, lots of information that we want to ensure other people become aware of uh, in, our, in our field and as well as in other fields where it's relevant. Uh, what I'm going to uh, provide you is a bit of an uh, idea of what our vision is 
and uh, our our mission uh, that we uh, that we focus uh, towards. Uh, the vision of uh, turf is to ensure people using roads make it home safely. We want that to happen every day by eliminating road deaths, serious injuries, and uh, obviously there's social costs. Uh, our mission is to be the knowledge source for road safety users, and we would like to try to do that on a worldwide basis. And we focus again on our research program and policy development, evaluation, and the transfer uh, and, and knowledge transfer, which is critical to ensuring that the important information that we generate uh, becomes better known uh, around the, not only in our country, but around the world. Uh, to begin, I wanna give you a uh, perspective on what I'm gonna cover this afternoon. So here's uh, the overview. I'm gonna give you a bit about uh, background just to give you a context in terms of the issue of teen driver crashes. I wanna talk about on a very general level what the contributing factors are because there's lots of them. And then I want to uh, focus and rivet down to uh, teen crash risks counter to sharing the road. And there's lots of things I could talk about there, but there's two I, I think are very important and I want to uh, focus and target on them. One is hazard perception and the other was, is distracted driving. Uh, Bruce already did a good job of, of discussing some of the efforts in the United States, at least I think nationally, in regards to educational solutions uh, to uh, uh, sharing the road issues generally. I'm gonna talk specifically about what some of those efforts are uh, in respect to teen drivers. And then I'm going to uh, end the presentation by discussing what I view as being uh, future directions with respect to educating and training teen drivers with respect to uh, sharing the road. I will provide at the end some resources that I found especially helpful in putting this presentation together, although there was a lot more things that I looked at. Uh, to begin, uh, what about teen driver crashes? Uh, they're both a road safety issue and a public health concern. They're a road safety issue because teens have an elevated crash risk. I think most of you will recognize that if you've been working in the traffic safety field uh, for any period of time. Uh, those ages 16 to 19 are nearly three times more likely than drivers aged 20 and older to be in a fatal crash per miles driven. So that takes into account, into account the actual driving exposure that uh, teens and other drivers have. Uh, from a public health pers uh, perspective, there's a real concern because motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death for teenagers and have been for some time. In fact, young people ages 15 to 19 represent only 7% of the US population but account for about 11% of the total costs of motor, uh, motor vehicle injuries. And that total co cost amounted to about $10 billion. There are several contributing factors to teen driver crashes. The two primary ones, uh, which can be categorized as being uh, involved with inexperience and age-related factors. Uh, in regards to inexperience, uh, certainly teens have problems with motor skills. Uh, they're, they become easily overloaded. They're just learning them. Uh, there's issues per, with perceptual skills, whereas there's, there's failure to identify and respond to hazards properly. And there's also cognitive skills that they have. They uh, misjud often misjudge risk and they often overestimate their own abilities as, as drivers. Uh, to combine with the inexperience, we're also dealing with age-related factors. Uh, not surprisingly, when you're 16 to 19, immaturity is a factor and youthfulness is a factor. You are young. And part of the difficulty is that you're often influenced by peers in the vehicle with you. Now, peers are not only negative. They, they have positive aspects to them, too, in the vehicle, but there are negative aspects to it. And certainly one is the susceptibility to engage in risk-taking behaviors. And there's also intentional risk, uh, risky driving behaviors where it's purpose of they're speeding on purpose because for, for the enjoyment and stimulation of it and distraction, which I'm going to get into a little bit more detail uh, in a little more detail in a little while. Two of the main uh, teen crash risk factors that I'm focusing on, and, and then they're just two, there are others that are important to, uh, to sharing the road. But these two, I, I, I think, especially counter uh, the ability to share the road adequately. Uh, one is hazard perception and the other is distracted driving. What is hazard perception? It's scanning effectively for potential hazards. You have to read the road. 
you have to anticipate, detect, and respond to events that may require an evasive maneuver, braking or change in direction to avoid uh, uh, crashing. Researchers have identified hazard perception as perhaps the most important skill needed to be learned by novice drivers. Uh, to uh, add to the difficulties novice face, there's also issues related to distracted driving. And what does that mean? That means that what you're doing is diverting your attention from driving. And certainly it's not only a factor with teen drivers, but all drivers, but particularly with teens. Uh, with distraction driving, the driver is temporarily focused on an object, person, task, or event not related to driving. They're not focusing on the driving task. Uh, it reduces the driver's awareness, decision-making, and or performance, leading to an increased risk of corrective actions, near crashes, and unfortunately, in tragic situations, actual crashes where people are injured and killed. Um, in terms of hazard perception and distracted driving, if you want to uh, focus a little bit more uh, specifically on young teen drivers, uh, young drivers compared to experienced drivers have poor hazard perception skills. There's lots of research that supports this. They have deficiencies in a, a number of uh, components of hazard perception because hazard perception is really a process. Uh, they have problems with hazard anticipation, prediction, mitigation, and maintenance, skills that all, you know, we all need. And if we don't have them very well, or we, we don't operate very well with, with them, these really contribute to the uh, teen driver elevated crash risk. In regards to distracted driving, teens are easily distracted by objects, tasks, and events, not only inside the vehicle, but all, also outside the vehicle. The types of distraction can include visual, auditory, cognitive or motor distractions. So there's a range of them that can be disruptive in terms of their safe driving. Uh, and of course, not surprisingly, engaging in distracted driving contributes to their elevated crash risk. If I look at more specific issues uh, with teens and hazard perception, what we find is what they have a tendency to do is look more to the front and right of the car uh, they are less skilled in using and detecting risks with peripheral vision and at redirecting central vision to the hazard. They're more inflexible in their search strategies. And what they do is concentrate their visual search in a smaller area. So they're not looking around uh, in front of uh, further down the roadway. So they're looking primarily closer to the front of the vehicle. They tend to use the same scanning pattern for all road types, although it may be required to use different types of standing, uh, uh, scanning patterns, whether you're on at an intersection or on a four lane highway. They're less sophisticated in terms of their mental model of the traffic environment, primarily because their search uh, is restricted by vehicle control requirements. Keep in mind, these are inexperienced drivers. They're basically learning uh, the skills necessary to operate and, and maintain the vehicle on the road. So it's very difficult for them to, uh, especially if they get distracted uh, in, in terms of some other task. Um, what results in uh, their uh, inexperience is that they tend to detect fewer hazards and they detect, detect them uh, more slowly, especially for hazards far away from the vehicle. In regards to distracted driving, there's a number of issues. Um, as I mentioned, teen drivers are more inexperienced at driving. And as we all know, their brains are not fully developed. Because of that, they're more susceptible to distractions and often they engage in poor judgment. They have a reduced ability to judge driving demands in relation to other potentially distracting tasks. They're more influenced by peer pressure, as I mentioned previously. And what this can often result in a distraction and, all, and as well a tendency to take risks. They tend to have a greater willingness to undertake secondary tasks, which are also uh, often distracting tasks while driving. That could be eating while driving or talking with a, a peer in the, in the vehicle. They get more uh, intense on those activities than actually what they're uh, doing in operating the car. They're also more receptive to adopting uh, new tech communication technology. As we all know, the issue of cell phones have been an issue with teen drivers for some time, but they've also adopted texting and driving as a, and it's become a real issue with teens. 
What's important to understand is that there's also an interaction between hazard perception and distraction. Distracted driving is related to driver inattention and to hazard perception. Hazard awareness, mitigation, and attention maintenance are critically necessary skills to avoid distracted driving. How is that so? Well, the failure to be aware of the risks involved in distracting driving and choosing to engage in this behavior often occurs in high-risk hazardous driving situations because they don't recognize the real risk in those situations. Uh, they lack the skill needed to mitigate or avoid the hazard, especially when they engage in a secondary activity. If they're talking with their peers, they're, they're more likely to be distracted and not be able to uh, avoid the hazard that may be approaching them and they recognize it's too late. Uh, and they often fail to maintain continuous attention to the primary driving task because of the, tech, te the secondary task, which is the distraction. Uh, this is not uh, surprising because an activity like texting your friend is much more stimulating and enjoyable than uh, necessarily operating the vehicle if you've been driving for a while. Um, What's important is there are solutions to these issues uh, that we already have in place today and there's more that we can do. Uh, the key issues of hazard perception, distracted driving and sharing the road, especially with commercial vehicles, can be addressed through uh, driver education and training. And we must recognize in that regard, there have been traditional and formal driver education and training programs across the United States for, for decades. And what the traditional uh, approach has typically been is what is referred to as the 36-6 model. It involves 30 hours of classroom theory, six hours behind the wheel, and six hours of observation in, in the vehicle. What's important is that over the last few decades, Stakeholders in the field of driver education with the uh, support of the National Highway Traf Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, have been engaged in an effort to improve driver education. And they've done that by developing and implementing the, the Novice Teen Driver Education and Training Administrative Standards, the TDIS. Uh, this applies a, a new model, an improved model of driver education and training which recommends 45 hours minimum in classroom uh, involving theory and instruction, 10 hours behind the wheel, and then 10 additional hours of flexible, uh, uh, diverse types of uh, education would, could include traditional classroom, online, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, driving simulation. So there's some real opportunities to enhance um, teen dri drivers and address issues like hazard perception and distracted driving and sharing the road uh, through the Natitis uh, new uh, standards. What I'd like to also point out that is Natitis recommends two curricula for driver education. One of the curricula is from the American Driver and Traffic Safety Education Association or ASIA, which some of you may know. And it does include lessons that deal with these critical issues. The lesson on uh, mental and perceptual awareness covers issues related to risk awareness or hazard perception. There's a lesson on factors affecting driving performance, and that includes uh, uh, information with respect to distracted driving. And if there is also a lesson that covers other road users, which discusses sharing the road, including sharing the road with large uh, trucks and commercial vehicles. The second curricula that Natitas uh, endorses is the Driving School Association of the Americas, DSAA. It also includes a lesson, oh, I should mention that uh, ANSIA represents primarily the public high uh, public driving education schools or high schools, uh, and uh, DSAA represents the private driving schools. The D DSAA lesson uh, plans include perception and risk management, so there's discussion of hazard perception, driver behavior, driver fitness task and risk management uh, lessons, which uh, includes information on distracted driving. And also a, sec a lesson on sharing the road includes sharing the road with large trucks and commercial vehicles. Now, importantly, these topics tend to be uh, discussed separately, um, often very independently. So you don't necessarily get a, a lesson on hazard perception and uh, in, in negotiating the highways with commercial vehicles.
Um, I wanna end my presentation then by talking about future directions because I think it's important to move towards or utilize programs that may already have done this uh, that uh, uh, implement uh, training programs that address the relationship between hazard perception, distracted driving and sharing the road with commercial vehicles. I think we have to talk about blended new programs into driver education to increase instructional hours. We have the opportunity and driver education now is the capacity with the new uh, national driver education standards to move from 30 to 45 hours uh, or more of, of classroom. And that could include traditional uh, classroom activities face-to-face -face with an instruct, uh, edu educator. It could be online or it could be virtual. It could involve driving simulation. So there's a real capacity there to address these issues with an expanded and enhanced uh, driver education program. I, I like to point out one program that have done, has done some of that the AAA How to Drive Novice Driver Training Program. That program meets ATSIA and DSAA uh, content standards. And what's important is that they've also included as part of their curriculum, hazard perception training scenarios. And these are taken from the risk awareness and perception training program that was developed several decades ago uh, uh, by Don, uh, uh, Don Fisher from the University of Massachusetts. Uh, that was under funding initially by NHTSA, but the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety have also provided funding for some of the recent updates of RAP. But importantly, what RAP does, it includes driving scenarios depicting hazardous situations that are associated with large trucks. So it, it integrates that, 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 kind of, uh, that kind of information. So I think that's a uh, real opportunity for moving the field further with respect to driver education and training. There's other future directions that I could uh, describe and they relate to de delivering uh, outside of driver education, this type of information. And that could involve uh, computer-based uh, training. It could be an online program. It could be in high schools. And I think as Bruce also mentioned uh, that Virginia Tech Transportation Institute has a program on sharing uh, uh, the road with trucks. And this is intended for trained drivers where they bring the vehicles right to the high schools to demonstrate issues related uh, with distraction and, uh, and uh, commercial vehicles. So I think we have to think about where other locations are in the kinds of events that free teens frequent to expose them to this, kinds of inf this kind of information. We have to seek opportunities for independent student learning. And what we have to look towards is complementary approaches these are likely needed, and I don't think we're going to find by just adopting one single solution, it's really going to be a silver bullet to help really move the move us forward with respect to reducing the number of teen crashes that involve commercial drivers and in general. Uh, finally, there's several resources uh, I found especially helpful for presentation uh, this presentation. And if you're someone in, involved with program development, I think you'd find them useful. One is by Sherilyn Klassen, uh, and she's with the University of Florida, and it focused on an integrated review on teen distracted driving for model program development. And the other one is by Lisa Buckley, and she's with a, an Australian group called Car, uh, Car, CarsQ in Australia, and it focuses on, it's, uh, they're with the University of uh, Brisbane, Queensland. Um, that focuses on young driver distraction state of the evidence and directions for behavior change programs. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to provide you information with respect to teen driving and sharing the road. If you need to get in touch with me uh, personally, there is my email address. If you wanna visit the TERF website, I included it there as well. And the TERF website is excellent. If you're looking for any materials on uh, uh, young and novice drivers, we have a resource center focused to that, on that. And we also have uh, a mod modules that deal with graduated licensing and, and novice drivers. One more slide. And just to, to end, uh, if you wanna get uh, follow us, there's a number of ways that you can do that up on this slide. Uh, thanks very much. That's all for me now. I think it's we're moving on to uh, Jack Kostelnik. Thank you, Robin. I'm muted. 
Um, we're going to move on to Kevin, actually. Um, I believe he's up next. So I think you're ready to go. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin. I am uh, ATA's Director for Safety and Technology Policy. And uh, sharing the road with commercial vehicles is an important topic for us here at ATA. Uh, and maybe I'd start off with a little bit of background to kind of introduce who is interested in sharing the road, because we at ATA connect a lot of different resources at a lot of different levels of the industry. Uh, we're an association of industry members, but we're also a federation of 50 state trucking associations. Uh, so we connect a lot of resources at the state level in addition to the federal level. Um, our members are very diverse. We include fleets, OEMs, suppliers, industry stakeholders, insurance, and things like that. But we're also a family of councils, and we specialize in a lot of different topics like maintenance, safety management, which is a big one for sharing the road, intermodal trucking. So we'll touch on other modes of transportation like railroad and things like that. And all across the board, sharing the road with commercial vehicles is an important topic. And one of our goals is to figure out how we can kind of distribute the needs to whoever is best at addressing them, whether that is something at the federal level, the state level, a member level, an individual member can get involved and partner with someone who needs outreach or education resources, uh, things like that. So we're excited to be here. Uh, we're excited to um, help out with this topic. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into kind of what the, the details are. I think everyone here is kind of aware of how driving a truck is different than driving a light vehicle. Uh, we know about the blind spots. We know about how different it is to break a heavy vehicle compared to a light vehicle. We know about turning radius and the, the momentum and the kinetic energy involved in a collision involving a truck. So I think everyone here understands the importance of sharing the road. Um, but as we just heard, um, if you haven't driven a truck, uh, it's easy to assume that it's like a car. And especially, I think, with a teen driver, like we just heard, they're learning about this for the first time. So it's easy to apply what you've just learned to other situations, other types of vehicles besides the one you're driving. And if you're inexperienced, you don't know any other paradigms to apply to vehicles you see on the road to determine, is that a threat? Is that something I need to respond to? So you know, our goal is to help everyone understand, uh, in particular, truck driver needs on the road, because that's what we specialize in. But we want everyone to be able to share their perspectives with everybody else on the road, whether that is a light vehicle, a motorcycle, a pedestrian, a bicyclist, whatever it might be. Um, but again, we specialize in trucking, so that's where we have resources available to you. And that's what I want the focus of my presentation to be, to let you know that we have resources available, everyone on this panel. If you have an audience that is looking for information about sharing the road with commercial vehicles, we can find something that will help you uh, get that message to that audience. So, like I said, ATA and its members, we try to educate uh, the public and policymakers about the challenges of safely operating commercial vehicles. We have resources of our own that focus on outreach and education. We have programs that we can uh, help you um, do that outreach and education. But we can also connect you to a number of different stakeholders that we work with. And um, Robin has put together a really great resource sheet uh, that we have tried to list some of these on. So you can find that on the website. Um, some of them I'm going to be showing you in my presentation, but there's others on the sheet as well that you can look through. Find the right people that are um, going to help you get the message across. Um, and importantly, we like to work with other stakeholder groups to learn how we can better share the road with other road users, how truck drivers can share the road better with all these other groups, because um, it's a two-way street. Uh, we need to learn and everyone else needs to learn from us. So the more we can all understand everyone's perspectives on the roadway, the safer we're going to be. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to America's road team. These are our road team captains. Uh, these are drivers selected from our membership uh, not only for their outstanding safety records, but also for their enthusiasm for educating people about truck driving and about uh, safety on the roadway. That's a rotating sort of cast. Um, every couple of years, we honor a, a group of drivers from our members uh, to be a road team captain. And um, through some generous sponsorships of our members, uh, they're able to essentially travel the country 
uh, to educate in, uh, educate everyone about our industry's uh, safety. So uh, they're selected from the safest drivers of our membership. Um, we have a beautiful truck that we'll uh, bring out to on site to um, help with the education of whatever the event might be. Uh, our members uh, and those drivers are very generous with their time, uh, and we're really appreciative of that. Um, you know, they're able to uh, spend a lot of time away from their normal job uh, doing education and outreach for our industry, uh, and it's it's very valuable. Um, and like I said, we we work on educating everything from uh, teen driver courses, just like uh, we heard before, to uh, ride-alongs with policymakers. Um, and help them understand uh, what it takes to be safe behind the wheel of a truck. Um, and I'm just gonna take an opportunity here um, to advertise this. If you have an event and you would like to have a professional driver bring a gorgeous truck uh, to come and help your audience learn about truck driving safety, give us a call, uh, shoot us an email, let us know. Um, like I said, this is a sponsored program. We have. Uh, these resources available to you so, and we want to send our um groups to uh to to do this outreach they, they're enthusiastic about it but uh in addition to just ata what i really want to emphasize is there are a lot of resources available if you are interested in sharing this message uh, like i said we're a federation and we have 50 state trucking associations that work with us Many of them have their own share the road programs that you can locally tap into to get information uh, about truck driving safety, uh, to get information about sharing the road safely with truck drivers, uh, or to get uh, local drivers on site to help do that education. Um, and many states face unique challenges to sharing the road and you can get kind of local specialized knowledge about that if you're in uh, the mountains in the Rockies out west. There are many safety issues uh, to sharing the road with trucks that you might not encounter out east. Or likewise, if you're in the north uh, in winter months, it's going to be very different than if you're in the south in summer months. So these state trucking associations, they know a lot of these sort of like local specialized topics. They can add to the more general sharing the road knowledge. Um, and like I said, it's 50 more resources at your fingertips. Um, for information, outreach, education. Um, again, some of these resources are in the sheet that we have on the website. I encourage you to go check that out. But I'm going to highlight a few of them here. Um, you know, some of these states have their own road teams, just like we have our national road team, Pennsylvania, Florida. You know, uh, I don't know if we're going to be sharing this presentation, but you can Google this or you can go to that resource uh, page and it will have the links in there. They'll send a local fleet with local drivers to come and talk to you about sharing the road with commercial vehicles. Uh, just like us, they have their own materials developed that you can insert into an existing program or add to an education program. Um, I had mentioned um, the different local challenges that you might experience. So Colorado Motor Carriers Association, they have this mountain rules program. It's actually a DOT program, but um, the Colorado Motor Carriers Association helps contribute to it. Again, um, DOTs, uh, we can help connect you to as well. A lot of state DOTs have great resources for sharing the road or work with the state motor carrier associations in order to develop these programs. And going to the other side of the spectrum, um, a lot of times people think about trucking safety as kind of like highway applications. It's it's over the road trucking, but commercial vehicles have to go everywhere. Uh, trucking Association of New York has this great smart streets program, uh, working with New York City to understand how trucks can operate safely in urban environments. Um, these are the kinds of uh, local uh, pieces of sharing the road that you can get if you work with one of our local um, state trucking associations. So, you know, each trucking association has their own ways of kind of doing this outreach. Some of them have their own road team. Some of them will partner with the state DOTs or other stakeholders locally. Get in contact with us. We're happy to get you in contact with the state association and help you find the right resources for whatever it is you're trying to put together. And like I said, a lot of these are also sponsored. 
A lot of the members are very generous with their time, and we appreciate that. You know, they they will get a driver um, to come out and do an on-site visit, uh, help get people into a truck to experience what it's like behind the wheel of a truck, see and feel what it's like in the cab and how it's different. Do ride along so you can feel what it's like when someone cuts off a truck on the highway. These are the kinds of things that you just can't get in a classroom setting. And, you know, beyond just our federation of associations, there are so many other stakeholders in trucking that are very, very interested in promoting um, sharing the road with trucks. Uh, like I said, local fleets and drivers, um, you know, a lot of them, if you give them a call and say, hey, we have an education opportunity, we'd love to get a driver to come and talk about what it's like on the road. They would be happy to help line up one of their drivers and, and get them to do that education. Uh, law enforcement is very interested in driving, uh, sharing the road and safe trucking. Um, we work with the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance, who also has resources in all 50 states. Um, they have a lot of their own education that you can uh, tap into. And again, uh, officers are very knowledgeable about truck safety and uh, having them supplement whatever it is you're trying to put together, great resource. I mentioned state DOTs already. A lot of them partner with the, the state trucking associations, but many of them have their own programs to promote safe driving, education resources ready to go that you can tap into and that you can uh, incorporate into whatever audience you think uh, needs to hear about this. And also there's a lot of community programs that you can tap into as well, uh, local programs that a lot of our um, uh, road team captains get involved in. Um, sometimes it's based around a particular corridor that has a lot of uh, freight traffic. Um, sometimes it's based around certain communities. Um, it, it just all depends. And we focus a lot on teen drivers because um, they do have an elevated risk, but it, you're never too old to, to learn something new. Um, a lot of adults need to learn about how to share the road with commercial vehicles. I know I did. I was an adult before I got into commercial vehicle safety and before I really understood how driving a truck is different than driving a car. Um, and also technologies. Um, we saw in the previous presentation, there's a lot of opportunities to use technology to educate drivers in general about distraction, um, about inattention, drowsiness, all of these issues. Uh, a lot of our members use these technologies. And um, when you use these technologies, you, you get to have a lot of ways to share with other people what you're seeing, how, how you are helping to try to alleviate these issues. You can share that with video, um, with examples, with case studies, whatever it might be. You can share that and that's a great way to kind of connect with other stakeholders or say, here's what we're doing in our industry. Maybe this would be a way to help your industry as well. Um, so I encourage you to, to go out and find a resource, talk to anybody on this panel. We'll be happy to connect you with a number of different resources that might be available for whatever it is that you're trying to, to put together. Um, and with that, I will reiterate, truck safety is a two-way street. So. Uh, we need to continue working to share the road safely, too, uh, with all the other types of road users. And like I said, we have our councils. We host a number of conferences and we host a lot of education sessions. We have show floors. We have industry working groups. We want to use these to educate our members on how we can be safer in trying to share the road with all the other road users out there. So, um, you know, if, if anyone has any ideas on how we can also improve our education for our members, how our truck drivers can be better at sharing the road with other road users. Come my way, let me know. And we really wanna be able to, to bring that education to our own members. You know, we want to be able to disseminate to everyone else the issues that we're seeing. And we also wanna be a way for everyone else to disseminate the issues they're seeing. So you know, please get in touch with me and, and let me know how we can be um, a good partner to, to make trucking safer for everybody from all angles. And I'll close out with this. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, uh, get connected with resources. There are many resources out there that can 
uh, help you um, work with any level of industry uh, that you want that's going to help you get the message across to your audience. We've got education materials. We've got drivers and equipment that'll come and, and meet you wherever it is you're trying to do your education. And we can connect you with a number of different resources that are uh, ready and waiting to help make truck driving safer for everyone. So um, nothing helps someone understand truck safety uh, from the driver's perspective, like getting into a truck. So any opportunities to do that, I think, um, are going to be invaluable. And um, like the previous presentation mentioned, um, getting those new and innovative sort of angles on your education to get people motivated and get people interested in the topic, it's going to go a long way. Great. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, lots of good information there and links uh, to examples of, of resources that are available. Um, and certainly to your point, it's a two-way street. Uh, I know a lot of work is done to improve uh, driver training for truck drivers um, to, to address uh, you know, some of the challenges that they face. Um, as well as the resources you talked about uh, for employers. Um, so just a quick reminder for people, we're gonna take questions at the end. So if you can put your questions in the chat, that would be great. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jack. All right, thank you, Robin. Um, first of all, I'm very appreciative to be here today to talk to you about sharing the road with commercial vehicles. Um, it's a very important topic as uh, the two other presenters have already said, and also Vice Chairman Lansbury. Um, we all need to share the road together, and it's a shared responsibility for everybody to do. So I just wanted to take some time today to also talk about what resources FMCSA or the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration has in regarding to sharing the road with commercial vehicles as well. Um, I believe everybody is familiar with uh, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, but I just wanted to take a second just to um, provide you with a high-level kind of overview of um, what we do. So our primary mission is to reduce commercial motor vehicle um, related fatalities and injuries. Um, and, and we do that by ensuring you know, safety in motor carrier operations through enforcement of safety regulations, targeting high-risk carriers and drivers um, and commercial um, motor vehicle drivers, improving safety information systems and commercial motor vehicle technologies, um, and also increasing safety awareness, which is why we're here today. So to accomplish these activities, the administration works with federal, state, and local enforcement agencies, the motor carrier industry, labor, and safety interest groups, and others. Um, and to kind of follow up with what Kevin said, um, he mentioned that they've worked with CVSA and they have resources. Um, we also provide grant funding to our motor carrier safety assistance program to our state um, agencies that do commercial vehicle enforcement. And as Kevin mentioned, they are very interested in sharing the road. They're very interested in providing outreach um, to others to improve safety around large, large trucks and buses. So as was mentioned earlier, I mean, almost everything that we own and almost everything that we, we eat at some point came on a truck. So no matter where you go, where, wherever you drive, you're going to encounter or you're gonna interact with a large truck. So there's 12 million large trucks and buses, um, or otherwise we call them commercial motor vehicles, we lump them together. They're registered to operate on America's roadways, and, and they also provide a critical role in our nation's economy, uh, and also the transport, our family members and our loved ones. So I'm gonna focus a little bit today on some of the differences between um, the commercial vehicles and um, other vehicles. So it's easy to think that, that all vehicles operate like cars, um, but as Kevin said, trucks and buses are, are difficult and have different challenges in regards to maneuvering. Um, they do have blind spots, which everybody I'm sure is aware of, and they take far longer to stop than another vehicle. So I wanted to point out here that the Our Roads, Our Safety campaign supports FMCSA's mission of reducing crashes, injuries, and fatalities involving large trucks and buses. And as part of this effort, um, FMCSA partners with other organizations to educate all drivers, cyclists, and pedestrians on the importance of sharing the road. So the more we understand each other's road experience, the better we can look out for one another. Uh, our public safety awareness campaign, the Our Roads, uh, Our Safety, provides unique points of viewpoint across the full range of road users. So this campaign also, and the partnership also makes, we have a Our Roads, Our Safety partnership. 
which makes available a wide range of materials that any organization with an interest in road safety may use to raise awareness and further promote safe driving around large trucks and buses. So the, the slides that I'm gonna bring up now that I'm gonna go through are primarily using those resources that we, we have. Uh, as you can see the graphic on the right, Kevin had mentioned about, we all know about the blind spots, um, but I think it's good to reiterate to, to folks that this it's a good refresher to know where the blind spots are in these large trucks that you need to keep outside of them. So when you're interacting with vehicles, uh, if you have to, to be alongside the truck, you wanna get through these areas as quickly as possible so that you can be seen um, and you can get past safely. So the commercial vehicle drivers, they can't see what's in their blind spots, so they need to pass through them quickly, um, as quickly as you can, so that you can remain safe. Um, also, be aware of long stopping distances. Um, in my previous experience as a state trooper, I have seen um, in my experience that a lot of other drivers take for granted the ability of trucks to be able to stop quickly when something happens. Um, and that's usually not the case because of their, their size and their weight. As Vice Chairman Landsberg mentioned earlier, they need a long time to stop. And so you need to leave extra space when merging in front of these large vehicles to give them the stopping space that they need. Uh, I know everybody is, is familiar with this, but um, we talked about um, younger drivers as well. And people have a tendency to you know, overestimate their driving ability. And so they, they sometimes take it for granted that the truck can stop. Um, when they can, so but they can take a lot of a lot of effort. So you don't want to follow too close or cut them off. So be sure to give them, um, you know, quite a bit of, of additional space. Um, also, um, driving at a safe speed. Um, you know, speeding is a major contributing factor to crashes, injuries, and fatalities. And one of the things about speeding is it's particularly deadly in terms of distracted driving. So if you're if you're driving at a higher rate of speed, inattention on the road due to the due to the vehicle speed, just you know, small things of inattention of, of um, distraction can lead to major consequences because you're traveling at a at a high rate of speed. Things can happen quickly. Um, if you look away, you can look up and in a fraction of a second, traffic could be stopped in front of you when it you you didn't see that earlier or there was no evidence of a slowdown. So it's very very important to main make sure that you're maintaining awareness of what's going on around you and to operate at a safe speed. And we all know that that's, roads have speed limits, um, but those speed limits are also out there and they're primarily meant for when the pavement is dry and clear. So as, as road conditions change and weather conditions change, it's very important that drivers be aware, especially around large trucks, that that in increases their stopping distance as well because the road is either wet or it's snow covered or whatever, that it's gonna take even longer to stop under those conditions. And also for them, they need to make sure that, that they're following at a safe distance, as I mentioned earlier, and that's gonna take longer for them to stop as well. So it's important to make sure that you, you drive at a safe speed at, at all times that where you can maintain control of your vehicle. And, and also when you're interacting with other vehicles um, that you're able to um, operate safely and be able to stop or take um, any action that you need in a safe manner. Uh, this particular graphic is this also comes from our our roads campaign website with safety tips around large trucks and buses. Um, I like this because it points out a lot of different things on one one particular graphic. Um, it talks about it kind of sums up everything about safety about driving vehicles where we've I've talked about these before. Kevin mentioned the the wide turns, so you don't want to try to you know squeeze by a truck when they're they're anticipating or anticipate that they're going to make a wide turn. Um, and staying out of the blind spots. So a couple of things I just wanted to mention really quickly is, first of all, one here, buckle up always. It's um, primarily, you know, sharing the road a large, around large trucks and buses is important uh, based on your driving behavior and, and how you actually operate your vehicle. But it's also important that you look out for your own well-being and, and buckle up when you're driving and make all your passengers do the same. Um, so that, that kind of goes without saying, but and not driving fatigued, and especially here at number 10, staying focused. Um, when you're interacting with large trucks, you know, these drivers are professional drivers. They, they drive a lot of miles. Many of them have gone millions of miles without, a, without an incident or a crash. Um, and so generally, they're always looking to, to be the safest drivers on the road. But 
Um, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of the crashes that occur are caused by other vehicles operating in and around the truck. Um, so make that awareness um, happen here is, is good so that everybody knows that uh, when they're operating around large trucks, they need to be particularly attentive and aware of, of what's going on around them um, in order to interact safely. So being that we were talking here about distracted driving, I just wanted to mention a couple of things here real quick. You know, distracted driving obviously is, is um, very dangerous for everyone on the road. I saw some the recent uh, statistics according to NHTSA that um, in 2021, there were over 3,500 fatalities that were attributed to distracted driving. So um, that's something that a uh, number that needs to come down. So you know, driving is a full-time job. So you know, drivers need to remain focused when they're behind the wheel. There's so many um, types of distraction, um, you know, eating, talking on a cell phone. Um, you know, we prohibit commercial drivers by our regulations from operating a commercial vehicle um, while they're texting. They're not allowed to text. They're not allowed to use a handheld telephone. But there are some states that that still don't have some of these laws in place that, to, that restrict those types of things. So um, one thing I did mention here is to activate your do not disturb while driving on your cell phone. So we, we you know, regulate the truck driving community on what, on what they should be doing and what they can't do when they're operating a truck. But um, a lot of, in fact, most, most of my family members, none of them knew that this even existed or was on their phone. So um, it's not activated by default. So you'd have to go in and activate it yourself, but um, calls and texts and whatever, can wait until you're no longer driving and you're parked in a safe place. So there's no call or text while you're driving that's that's worth your life. So um, that's another particular thing to reduce distraction, but also there's other types of distraction as well. You know, changing the radio station, uh, just uh, looking out, out the window, looking at various things that are going on around you can, can attract, distract you from the driving task itself as well. So a lot of our, our key messages are so our central camp, our, our road safety campaign are focused on the CMV drivers, but these can also be, we also have resources available for other road users as well. So um, we're particularly, the agency is an important resource and partner for CMV drivers when, in terms of, of safety. Um, and so it's a personal and professional responsibility of the CMV drivers, obviously to operate their vehicle and share the road safely, but it's also incumbent upon all road users to, um, realize that this is also a personal responsibility that they need to take seriously when they're driving down the road so everyone can share the road safely and get where they need to go um, in a safe safe manner. So lastly, I'll just wrap up here. Uh, when it comes to distracted driving, we have some shareable materials. I talked about all, all of this information that's on our website. Uh, I just wanted to point out some of these really quickly, some of the shareable materials. This, this is particularly to distracted driving, but there are other materials as well that are available. There's um, a toolkit um, that anyone can download. So if you have a safety campaign or something that you're doing, um, you can customize these and you can download these from our website. Anyone can use them. So the toolkit includes some of these. I'm not gonna go through all these, but those are the resources that are available in the toolkit that you can use. Um, and so these materials are, um, you know, free for anyone to use. And you can, you know, as I said, you can customize them. Um, so, and then finally, I just wanted to let you know that, that we have tip sheets and other resources available. So um, you can go to our website, you can go to Our Roads, Our Safety um, on FMCSA's website. You can also contact our outreach office at the, you see the, the address there at the, at dot.gov, fmc.outreach. And um, they'll also provide materials for you. If you need to print, need printed materials, they can also provide them for your use as well. So with that, I will wrap up my presentation and, and um, say thank you. And I'll now turn this over to Matt. All right, thanks a lot, Jack. Give me a second while I key up my presentation here. All right, thanks everyone for, for joining our call today. Um, we've learned a lot of really valuable 
skills, information about how we can share the road with trucks and why it's important. Um, for my part of this presentation today, I just want to give a, a little bit of an overview of a program that we've put together at the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute over the years um, where we partner. We do a lot of partnering, as, as Kevin mentioned, with ATA, with local truck companies, with other organizations to disseminate this critical information to drivers using our roads when they're operating around commercial motor vehicles. Um, even though we're based out of Blacksburg, Virginia, we travel across the entire country with our program. We either have been or are planning events in 12 states right now. So most of them are kind of focused in the mid-Atlantic, um, but also kind of the Northeast region, but we're getting further West um, as this program kind of continues to grow. So we've heard a couple a couple really important reasons why it's important um, to talk about sharing the road with trucks. And over the past 35 years, when the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute has been conducting our research, we have learned a whole lot of information from our naturalistic driving studies where we collect data from video cameras, from radar, from sensors, and a lot of advanced equipment and vehicles out on the road to understand what's going on right before a crash or a near crash occurs. And what we found when there's a crash or a near crash, such as a close call involving a tractor trailer and another vehicle, 78% of those events can be contributed to something the light vehicle driver did right before that, that close call or that crash. And as we've also heard, you know, the people in the, in the light vehicle also come out on the, on the losing end of that event. Year over year, over 80% of the fatalities and crashes involving tractor trailers and smaller vehicles or occupants in that smaller vehicle or that light vehicle. So what the research is telling us is that a lot of these events can be contributed to something the light vehicle driver does, but at the end of the day, they're also the ones that are being the impacted the most. So this is really important for us to give information about driving around trucks and what we can do in our light vehicles to keep ourselves safe and to keep our occupants in our vehicles safe. Now, we've also done a lot of research to understand what are we teaching drivers about sharing the road with trucks? We did a study about 10 years ago, so it's definitely might have changed since that point in time. But what we found was that only 53% of the states actually required new drivers to learn about sharing the road with commercial motor vehicles. Now, with that said, we've also talked to a lot of drivers and instructors over the years, and we found that many, many, many of them kind of go above and beyond what's, what's the minimum requirement. But all of these instructors that we've talked to really emphasize a need for more information, for more materials um, about sharing the road with trucks. And it's also, as kind of Kevin alluded to, there's a lot of programs out there teaching teens teaching drivers about how to be safe around large trucks. But what we know is no matter how many of these programs are out there, there's never gonna be enough to reach everyone. So it really emphasizes the need to collaborate and to work together to get information out to as many people as we possibly can. So our program um, actually started back in 2015 um, based on some pilot studies we did where we learned that students actually retained more knowledge, more information um, from participating in immersive experiences. So in other words, from getting out of the classroom, getting their hands on a truck and experiencing like where blind spots are on a tractor trailer. Because one thing we, we all know about blind spots, but what we've heard from our students when they participate in programs is they get into the seat of, a, of the tractor trailer. We show them where the blind spots are and they come out saying, oh, that's what you mean by a blind spot. And it just clicks. So this immersive experience is really beneficial to help drive home the point about how to be safe around tractor trailers. Um, we've done a lot of 
follow-up information, follow-up data collection efforts after students participate in our program. And we've seen pretty much on average across all of the different studies we've completed, students are able to answer about 25% um, more questions than they were beforehand about critical information, about kind of characteristics about trucks, why it's important to be safe and how to be safe. Um, and actually, as of today, we've reached over 25,000 teens across the entire country with this program. Now, when we go out to high schools, we have a two-part um, program that includes an in-class presentation and also an out-of-the-class hands-on demonstration. So the in-class presentation is, is roughly 20 minutes long. Um, and a lot of this is giving the teens information about why this is important, why we're there talking to them about driving safety. So we give them some statistics about light vehicle involved crashes. Um, we give them information about characteristics of large trucks, like some of the things that Jack and Kevin have mentioned, such as how, how heavy trucks can be, um, how long they can be, and uh, the stopping distance required for trucks. Because a lot of times, as Jack mentioned, um, teens don't understand, you know, how long it takes a tractor trailer to stop or why we see signs on the back of tractor saying, trailer saying, you know, these trucks make wide turns. Um, and then we use this presentation to, to kind of key up five strategies that we've learned over the years can really be useful to help prevent a lot of these types of crashes. Um, and then a key part of, of what we do inside is we show the students real world examples from light vehicle drivers doing things unsafe around trucks that are causing events. But we also give them examples about what they, what they can do and what they can do to be safe to avoid these types of events. Um, so the five strategies we focus on are based on our nationalistic driving research and other information that we've pulled from FMCSA, from ATA over the years and from other kind of leading organizations that do these types of demonstrations. Um, so the first one, of course, is don't hang on the no zones. I think this is really important um, because if we are lingering or hanging out or driving in a blind spot around a tractor trailer, we're not visible. And a truck driver is going to be looking in their mirrors before making a maneuver or making a turn. And if we are in a blind spot, of course, they may not know we're there and they, they could hit us or cause a safety related event. Um, we also really emphasize knowing how to properly pass trucks. There is certainly a safe way to pass trucks, but there's also certainly unsafe ways to pass tractor trailers. So we emphasize the need to, to pass on the left side of the truck to go by at a safe, constant, steady speed so that we are not lingering around the sides of the truck. And then after we've passed, we talk about the importance of not cutting trucks off. It's one of the most risky things that we do, given the long stopping distance tractor trailers have. But unfortunately, it's also one of the most common mistakes we see people make when we are driving out to events and what we see in our naturalistic driving research itself. Um, we talk about not getting squeezed. Um, this is, has also been brought up. Tractor trailers make really wide turns, and a lot of people get impatient or don't understand what trucks are doing when they are setting up for these wide turns. So we give information to the teens, you know, about why trucks do this, how they are operating, and what the team can do to help prevent these um, these turning squeeze uh, incidents. And then finally, we talk about maintaining a safe following distance. This one's really important. As we all know, underride crashes are, are devastating. And fortunately, the teams, you know, they can prevent these by keeping a safe following distance and paying attention. And this is a point that we emphasize throughout the entire program is that none of these strategies are going to work if the driver is not paying attention. We emphasize and we show videos about what can happen um, when we are paying attention to our phone, when we're texting, and how quickly one of these really serious events can take place. Um, here's just a, a quick example about um, for a, a video that we show to the teens. Um, as we play this, you know, this is a video example showing a, an unsafe pass. That black pickup truck passes truck on the right side of the road, um, went through the right blind spot. Fortunately, they went by the truck fast, but the really risky thing is they cut this truck off at the end, probably only gave the truck about 
10 to 15 feet of space to slow down. If that truck driver had not been paying attention or was looking in the wrong place at that exact time, this could have ended very differently. Um, and then we also show the video examples, of course, of um, the left blind spot too, because even though passing on the left is the safer option, there still is that blind spot over there. And we don't wanna linger around the sides of the truck because we can get stuck in that left blind spot. Um, and it really just helps the teens understand kind of what we're talking about because we can give the teens information, we can give them tips all day, but unless we can actually show them what we're talking about, it's hard for them to understand and conceptualize it for when they're driving out on the road. So when we get outside, we have up to six stations, depending on how big the school is, how many students there are, and what kind of partnerships we've involved in that demonstration. So of course, the, the key to this is that in-cab experience where we get every single team um, up inside the cab of the truck, ask them to look out the mirrors, look out the windows, and try to identify the objects or vehicles that we've placed around the tractor trailer in the blind spot. So typically we have a vehicle on both the left side and the right side of the truck. We have a bicycle or a motorcycle up in the front nose zone to help illustrate that even up to 20 feet out in front of the truck, depending on you know, the manufacturer of that truck, we could be invisible to the truck driver. And then we also have a vehicle placed in the rear nose zone. And, and usually that's a law enforcement vehicle. Um, we partner with the state police or the motor um, carrier enforcement agency in that state to have a vehicle placed roughly 100 to 120 feet back behind the truck. So the students understand that even 100 feet back, that vehicle is still not visible to the truck driver. Um, when we have professional truck drivers available from local fleets, we really emphasize and ask them to, to communicate with the teens kind of what they see on an everyday basis when they're making their routes, when they're making their deliveries um, to help give a face to the industry for these, um, for these new novice drivers. Um, we also have a supplemental video we share with the teens. We have the state trooper come out and talk um, to give insight into what they see when they respond to crashes involving commercial motor vehicles. Um, and then we break and talk more about the rear nose zone and then also kind of the blind spots around the truck and how to properly pass. Um, but as Kevin mentioned, you know, this information just isn't for teens. And what is, is really enlightening when we go out to schools is that very often the driver ed instructor comes up to us afterwards and like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, I've been teaching this the wrong way for the last 15 years or the last 20 years. And the driver ed instructors are actually learning information too. Um, and what we know that, you know, we go out and drive, we see all sorts of people making these same mistakes out on the road. So what we are starting to do is to really broaden our focus beyond teens. So we are attending community events, such as state fairs or, or county fairs with our truck, which is essentially a billboard. Um, and we interact with, with adults of all ages to get them behind the wheel and let them visualize where the blind spots are. Uh, we have been really emphasizing making TV segments or radio segments, sharing this information out to the general driving public. Uh, we're going to conferences all across the country, um, setting up booths, providing our kind of handouts, our free resources to teachers or to other community members um, to help disseminate this life-saving information. Um, we're participating in truck convoys. Most recently we did the Delaware Special Olympics convoy, um, just to kind of highlight the importance of sharing the road with trucks. Um, we've done train the trainer webinars for other driver um, education providers, such as the AARP. Um, we did uh, two virtual webinars with um, their instructors so that they could incorporate some of these materials into their edu uh, driver education programs. Um, we're doing virtual webinars and virtual programs um, so that we're not just touching people in person. We can touch people all across the country in a virtual setting. Um, and then also most recently, we are developing and implementing a virtual reality program using simulators. So we're leveraging that technology because one thing we know is that some people can't get up into a truck cab, um, whether they have mobility issues, whether they have an injury um, or are handicapped um, uh, needing needing handicap um, like wheelchairs or crutches to get around. So they can't get up into a truck cab, but 
it's still really important for, for them to understand and have this immersive experience as well. So we're leveraging technology to help demonstrate the importance and, and what we can do to help keep our sale, ourselves safe and the truck drivers safe. Um, and then finally, one other resource that's freely available for anyone to go to is, is we have a website at cmvroadsharing.org. Um, we have all the five key strategies on the website. We have video examples from each of the strategies we talk about. Um, a couple of years ago, we worked with the National Safety Council and the Road to Zero program to put together a four-part video series. All of that information is available on the website for the general public to use, for driver and instructors to use, um, to really just get this information out to as many people as we possibly can. Um, so with that, I will pass it back to Robin, and I think uh, all of the panel members here would be happy to answer any questions. Perfect. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, that was a great presentation. And thank you to all our presenters. Um, uh, we do have a couple of, couple of quick questions. Um, and I would just ask the, the presenters to, to try and be concise with their, their answers so we can get to all of them. Um, so, uh, Dan, let's start with you uh, with the driver training. So how important is it for parents to practice with teens? around large trucks and what would be kind of your best uh, suggestion for for how to tackle that safely and dan i think you're muted now that Sorry now the that. webinar is complete but yeah we always need someone to say that at least once <laughs> yeah i think it's, it would be very important to have parents uh, engage with teens on issues related to sharing the road with large trucks uh, and I, I think it would be a, an opportunity to do that through parent involvement uh, uh, in the driver education program themselves. Often there's there's a uh, parent involvement at the start of the program or sometime during the uh, driver education program, depending on the state that you're in and the requirements that are applied in those states. But I, I, would, I think for the, some of the other panelists as well, um, I think it would be important in that parent, a lot of the parents, especially if they're looking at going beyond teens and sh and having this kind kind of information available to other uh, uh, members of the public, parents have teenagers. So some of the the target groups they're looking at beyond teens will be parents, and to engage the parent as well in some of these uh, ride along in in the uh, commercial vehicle to get some sense of the risks that the the teen might face, I think would be great. Great, thanks very much, Dan. And then uh, a quick question for for Kevin and perhaps uh, Jack. With the use of technologies, um, there's always improvements in in terms of safety technology. Some of them are a little slower to get to to larger trucks for for important reasons. But I know in Canada we've seen really an embracing of outward facing cameras, um, and to a lesser extent inward facing cameras. Um, and I know. From a number of the companies that we've that we've chatted with in in Canada, having those outward facing cameras is good because then you can kind of capture what happens uh, in a crash or in an incident. And I was just wondering if there's that same level of uptake and interest uh, in um, among either regulators or among the associations in each state uh, for the use of those outward and inward facing cameras. Um, well, I can start. We've definitely seen a lot more interest in it recently. Um, and some of that is due to liability reasons, in addition to safety reasons. Um, but one of the things that we've seen is that um, it's only as good as what you do with the technology, especially when it comes to a camera, as opposed to something like automatic braking that would have an intervention regardless. Um, Virginia Tech actually did some great research on this, um, looking at how the different ways that you use a technology like cameras affects the outcomes that you get. So. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do with our members is understand how to set up kind of those programs, help them figure out the best ways to use that data um, effectively so that they can actually see the best benefits out of it. Great, great. Thank you. Jack, did you want to add to that? or? Uh, no, I think Kevin covered it pretty well. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, and uh, for Matt, um, I was uh, very interested in learning more about VTTI's program. I think it's really well developed. Um, so uh, a quick comment. One, do you address the issue of uh, blowouts, tire blowouts? Um, I know that's one of the things that that we've learned is you hang out beside a truck and there's a blowout and it's a sonic boom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely do. Down. When we're outside, so one of the stations is talking about passing trucks. And I always emphasize that even if we're not riding in the blind spot, you still don't want to linger beside the truck for a number of different reasons. But one of one of those reasons is the tire blowout. And I'm like, you know, have you have you seen all of the rubber debris all over the road? And they're all like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times they don't understand what what that is or where it came from. And we talk about the retread and we talk about the tire blowouts. Um, we talk about, you know, the either the the drive tire, if that blows out, it's literally could be an explosion. It can pull the truck over into your lane. So the, the key is, is really just respecting the amount of space trucks need. And also just spending the least amount of time a, as we can safely do as, as we go by. Yeah. And then when you, the cutting back in front, what's the rule of thumb for how oh, yeah. much distance you should leave? Uh, yeah, so that's that, an important one. And I see it often on the highways. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So something else that, that we like to emphasize is giving the teens like tips that are not based on like distance, because it's, we know people are really bad at like judging the health. The, uh, like an actual like feet distance. So we asked the teens after they've passed the truck to look up in their rear view mirror and see the entire front side of the tractor trailer. And we emphasize that that doesn't mean like just the grill or just the headlights. We want, we want the teens to see all the way to the very top of the truck. So it's an easy kind of tool that the teens can remember um, and they can use it. Yeah, great point. Great point. Um, uh, one of the uh, questions in the chat was, uh, there's a focus by some lawmakers and stakeholders to allow drivers over 18 and under 21 to be allowed to uh, obtain a long haul interstate commercial driver's license. Um, what do each of you think about changing the law to allow for this uh, in terms of safety? And I guess maybe a more general question with respect to driver education and training and how that's evolving. I know in Canada, the standards and the, the length of training, um, as well as onboarding has has really risen to make sure that those drivers are as safe as possible. So are we seeing that that trend in the US? And, and what are your thoughts on the question? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. You want to make sure that this is the safest cohort of drivers that we've ever had kind of pushing their way through the system. And technology is a lot of uh, is a good way to set up a lot of those sort of guardrails on it, whether it is um, safety technologies that are in the cab of the truck or if it's uh, programs that the fleet builds around these technologies to help the drivers um, get kind of like the, the feedback they need to continuously improve. Uh, but yeah, it's, you want to make that cohort as safe as possible as it moves through the system. Yeah, ultimately. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I believe we're we're completed for time. I didn't know if the vice chairman had any last thoughts or Nick, if you wanted to wrap up. No particular thoughts other than to tell everybody, you know, my background is in aviation and I spent my entire career, you don't get to look like this unless you've done it for a while, but I've spent my entire career flying uh, airplanes and everybody worries about airplanes. The focus is in the wrong place. The focus needs to be on the highways, and we are all convinced that we're very good drivers and we're never going to have a problem. It always happens to the other person. And I think we have to help everybody to understand we are all vulnerable and we are all responsible for our actions. So I, I just have to compliment all of our presenters and National Distracted Driving Coalition for bringing this uh, to the, the foreground. And we can't stop here. We have to keep going because by the end of today, we will have lost at least 100 more people and thousands more who have been injured. So this is not just about statistics. It's not just about presentations. This is about safety and people's lives. So with that, I will, I will stop here, but say everybody, please, please, be aware of driving around big trucks. And for heaven's sakes, put the cell phone down for other than uh, driving tasks.
Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And this uh, this webinar, the presentations and the webinar recording will be available on the US NDDC uh, website. And Nick, last thought to you. To close yeah, I don't out. have anything, but uh, thank you. Thanks to all the panelists. And uh, if you want to collaborate with us or with NTSB, you can feel free to reach out to me as well. Nicholas.warrell at NTSB.gov. Uh, feel free to, or you can reach me to any one of the, the panelists here as well. And um, I, as the vice chairman said, we cannot do this work alone. We have to collaborate and work with each other because we all have one common goal in mind to reduce the accidents, crashes, injuries, and fatalities on the road. Thank you.